We're live, live from my creative editing suite upstairs here in my secret room at my studio in Portsmouth. You should come down if you're near Portsmouth, come and visit us and I'll show you our secret room and what it does. But this is just a tiny corner of it and this is where I do all of my photo editing. Hello, my name's James. I'm a portrait photographer from Portsmouth in the UK. You've probably not heard of me and I see in the chat that you've been telling us where you're from. We had lots of people two days ago downstairs in the studio for the live shoot. And uh, they were from all over the world, uh, from places far and wide. So do get in the chat. Tell us. We want to know where the furthest person is who's tuning in live. It still amazes me that we can do these things live. I, when I first started to go to photographic seminars, you had to go out in person uh, into like a village hall somewhere. Uh, but this is great that we can reach out to so many people globally. So let us know where you are. There will be a prize uh, for the person who is hailing from the furthest. Uh, we are going to be doing edits from our shoot two days ago. Thank you very much if you joined us. I know most of you did for that live shoot with Jasmine, our ballerina in Converse. If you didn't see it, you can check it out. Uh, go on to the Lumesca YouTube channel and you'll be able to find it from there. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at those images. We're going to be looking at how we do proper colour calibration using uh, the passport and we're going to be discussing uh, screen technology with our lovely BenQ SW270C photo view monitor here and we're going to be talking about all the different bits of software and I'm going to be going into Photoshop and showing you how I use Lightroom and Photoshop to create a final image for print and then hopefully for sale that's what we're all about here really um so first things first what we're going to do is we're going to take you uh, to my desktop we're going to have a look in our lightroom folder here um so we should be here in our uh, lightroom uh with all of the images that we shot from the session just scrolling along here i've just imported them with the standard adobe color profile there just the standard adobe color profile and that's all of the images that we shot from the session there around about 30 two images. The first image uh, we shot, uh, which we discussed uh, on, on, the, on the shoot on the day, the first image we shot there is of the Color Checker Passport. And that Color Checker Passport was shot with a single light, an Elencron 1 light. It was shot with the Canon R6 body, and it was shot with the 24 to 105 uh, f4 lens. That's my workhorse lens in the studio, 24 to 105. Got a great range on it. I can shoot full length portraits and close up portraits there. It's a really, really cool portrait. But what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be uh, showing you how we can use the software here that's been embedded uh, into our uh, in, into our Lightroom from downloading uh, from, from, from the website there, how we can apply Adobe Camera Raw Correction. So the first thing we're going to be doing for this image here, nothing done to this image at all. It's exactly as shot in, in camera. It is a CR3 image, which is a camera raw image. I'm going to get hold of my crop tool here, and I'm just going to crop around uh, the color checker passport there, just so we've got a nice, clean shot of the passport itself. Now, what we want to do is we want to create a profile uh, based on the data in this passport. So as we discussed a couple of nights ago, every time you take a shot with a different light or a different lens or a different body, it's going to affect the color slightly differently. And we're going to be using the calibration software here uh, to get the biggest range of color that we can so we can get the maximum amount of real color range uh, out, of, uh, out of our raw image. Uh, I'm going to be processing, just before we carry on, on this BenQ monitor. Now, my monitor is used quite a lot. I use it daily in studio. Uh, so I recommend for myself a one-week calibration update. And I keep my Color Checker Display Pro on my desk here. And I make sure uh, that I get my screen calibrated so that I know that everything I'm seeing on this screen is real color. Nothing has changed at all. What I genuinely like, I've had, I've had this screen now a month. What I genuinely like about this screen is how sturdy it feels. I've worked with screens in the past where the hoods uh, aren't that sturdy. They're a bit flimsy. They fall off. They're a bit metallic. This has got a lovely, lovely sort of uh, uh, velvet interior, if, if, if you like. But it's really, 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 really sturdy. And the benefit of the hood is, is that it blocks out all of the ambient light in this room. So I've got some spotlights over there for my viewing theater. I've got fluorescent lighting above me. I've got all kinds of distractions around me. With the hood, I know that all of the light is, 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 is excluded. So, uh, so there's nothing shining on the screen. And even if there was something shining on the screen, the screen is a matte finish. There's completely no reflections in the screen at all. So I know that I can concentrate on the image and the image alone. 
Going into this here now, we've got the uh, color checker passport here. This was as it was shot. So we're going to go up to our file menu up in the top left hand corner here. And we're going to go to our export. Where we are? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Export with preset, which is down here. And then we're going to go down to the color checker camera calibration. Uh, and we're going to be creating a, a digital negative, a DNG profile name for this. So the profile name I'm going to give it is Jasmine. And I'm just going to name check the R6. And I'm going to name check the lens. And I'm just going to name check the light. So those three variants that could change the color, I'm just going to name check those so I know exactly which profile to look for when I change it later on. Now you can see up here it's processing the file. This takes around about 20 seconds. Uh, so while we're waiting for that to, to do that in those 20 seconds, we're going to ask you a trivia question. Always have trivia questions. I know people like a quiz. So we're going to do a quiz for you in the chat now. Uh, which American state is the last state alphabetically? Who's the first person to answer? You can let me know when it comes in. You look at me. Oh, is there someone coming? The last state alphabetically is... Let's see if the uh, Color Checker Pro is still working on that. Someone should be able to give me this. I had to memorize all 50 states. Wisconsin is... Wisconsin is incorrect. Try again. Wyoming. Wyoming. Stephen Wyoming. Thorpe, yeah, Who's that? Stephen Thorpe. Stephen Thorpe. Congratulations, Wyoming. Your prize is a big round of applause. Well done. Very good indeed. Lovely. There it is. Let's just see how we're doing here. Still processing the file in there. I had to memorize all 50 states and all, I think, 56 African countries for the ITV quiz show Tenable uh, because I thought it might come up. And it didn't come up. Luckily... Uh, James Bond movies did, and I didn't have to revise for that because I already know my James Bond movies. So that's cool. As we're processing the profile here, what we can do is we can go back into some of the images here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a quick edit. Um, the way that I edit is, is I'll, I'll use the flag system, uh, which is X for to, to flag an image, uh, zero, uh, O, the letter O, to, 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 get, to, to, to keep an image unflagged, and then P to pick an image. So I'm using P to pick the ones that I really, really like, and X to get rid of any ones that I really, really don't like. Going back in here, and we can just start to compare similar images here, like these two here are very, very similar. So I can just choose between one of those, and I'm just going to get rid of one of those by hitting X. And then these two here, we can obviously bring up, we can go into our library, and we can start to compare two next to each other by clicking this little icon down here, the survey view, and just have a look at those two together. I actually quite like the way that she's got her chin lifted up on this one. I'm going to discuss this a little bit more later on. So we'll just lose the first one by pressing X, and then we're going to keep that one. I like this one where we turn to the light. This is one where we, for those who weren't in on the seminar the other day, or for those that were, the main difference between these two is the light is on different sides, but also the one on the right here has a big ref white reflector down the left-hand side, which is pushing uh, a, a white, white reflection back in there. And oh, just as we finish, uh, the profile has been generated successfully. Lightroom must be restarted to activate the profile. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go back into there because I realized that I can't click OK while I'm on this camera. So I'm going to hit OK, and we're just going to shut down Lightroom there. Do I really want to quit? Yeah, I really want to quit. There we go. Cool. Now, if we open up Lightroom again, I'm going to bring it back up in here. Everything's reloaded back up on there. I just need to bring in my flags again. And I'm going to bring in my rated system as, as well as well, because we're going to be using that rating system later on. So at the moment, there we go, we get rid of those. There we go. So now we're literally only showing the picked files. Now this image here, which is of the uh, color checker passport, still has the Adobe standard color profile. And these are the standard profiles you'll get when you download, Light, uh, when you download Lightroom. You can have your landscapes, your portraits and your standards. What I want you to notice is this grid of nine squares here. This grid of nine squares here is particularly the blues. And just look at how these blues change as we go from one profile to the next. If I go to my grid view now, just close that off just for a second, I'm gonna go back to Adobe Color. Actually, we'll go back to Adobe Standard. There we go. We're going to hit this icon here, which is going to bring up all of my profiles in grid view with my favorites at the top, Adobe Raw ones there, 
camera matching ones there, and all the way down into profiles. Now profiles, this last one here, are all of the profiles that I have saved uh, previously using the, uh, using the software. Now, when I find my one, which is the Jasmine R6 24105, which is this one here, there we go. And I'm just gonna favorite that one. So now when I close this off, up in my shortcuts here, I already have the Adobe Color uh, Landscape and Vivid ones, but my Jasmine R6 24 to 105 one is already in there for a quick find. Let's go back to Adobe Color, look at those blues. And now let's go back to Jasmine, Look at those blues. Look at the difference in all of the colors there, but particularly the, the blues. And if we're not shooting with the passport, if we're not taking a, a color reading, and if we're not using Adobe Camera Raw correction, then we're losing data. Or to put it another way, actually, we're not maximizing the data in the raw file, okay? Now there is a super quick way to do this as well with our color checker camera calibration software. And we're just gonna bring this up in here. We can drag and drop a DNG, a digital negative image here. So if we've created a DNG, which I've created previously of Jasmine here, holding it, holding the color checker passport, we can drag and drop it in there. And this will load the image up and there, that quickly, immediately identify the passport, immediately identify all of your areas of color, and you can just create a profile by clicking Create Profile at the bottom there. But we're gonna be working almost exclusively in Lightroom here today. Now, what we can do, we know that the selection of images below us here were all shot with the same camera, the same body, and the same uh, flash unit with no changes to power. So what we can do is that we can select everything and I'm just gonna to go to library view here, just so you can see. We can select everything there, perfect. And we know that all of these are going to be properly color calibrated with the new profile. So we go into develop, we select our Jasmine profile, the colors shift, and now we can sync all of those up together by clicking sync down here, and by treatment and profile, just having that clicked. You can check all or check none from there. I clear it by checking none. And click your treatment and profile, and you can sync all of these images up together. So now, all of our images have got the proper calibration software. If I just take this image as an instance, and we just go back to Adobe Color, look at the shifting color, particularly in those skin tones. And now look. The other thing that we can do is that we can look at color temperature. So if we uncrop this image here, we can use the passport, here we go, and using our color picker to affect the white balance. My white balance was shot at 4,750. I tend to shoot quite cold in studio. This is a complete personal preference but I shoot re relatively colder skin tones and I look to maybe just warm them up just a little bit later. I don't want too many magentas, too many reds in my skin tones, okay? So that's why I deliberately set it. The other reason why I deliberately set it to 4,750 is just because I want all of my images to be consistent so that if I do need to change them, I can change them all consistently as well later on. What we can do with the profile here, though, is we can select our 12% uh, gray, which is the third patch along here. Get our white picker and just click that there. And now we're white balanced. Now this is, or should be, what came out, um, what, what was actually in the room at the time. What should be real, proper, true color from all of the light that was falling on the subjects at the time. We can warm these skin tones up with this row here. The one with the tiny notch in here that you can see on the far left, and you can tell that this is the portrait one because it's got a little image of a face here, is, 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 is your 0% color. So when you start moving across the image and clicking, the image will get warmer and warmer and warmer. And you can go back down the back down the route as well. We'll just do a big shift 
going back to the going back to the standard white balance there with the one in the notch at the far left that's the one you use and then if we just go super warm just to show you exactly how boom and you've all of a sudden got really warm skin tones so if you're if you're a warm skin tone photographer you like seeing warm skin tones coming across in your portraits that's the ones that you want to use but you'll find your balance in there and again you can just batch process throughout the entire collection One other thing here to note as well for landscape photographers, this one here affects your landscapes and affects your natural tones and colors within the natural world. So if you are a keen landscape photographer, that's a really, really effective tool along the bottom to use to warm or to cool your landscapes for your, for your landscape photography to get true color. Lovely stuff. What I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna pick um, three images uh, uh, that I really like, that I think are really, really strong. And if we've got time, we're going to try and process uh, all three of them here. Um, this one here, I'll just go through my editing process with you again. I do like that one. So we're just going to hit a P on that one and pick that one. Uh, we're going to pick that one because that was really, really strong, just straight down the middle of the lens. Remember, these have all now been corrected, uh, color corrected with the new profile. So what I know I'm looking at is correct. Didn't like the lift up of the head there. So we're just going to lose that one. We're going to keep that first one there, change that one to P for pick. That was the awkward posing one. I did, an, I did a deliberately awful shot uh, with terrible photography and interpersonal skills. I implore you to go back and look at the video from two days ago to see what a terrible photographer I can be. We're going to unpick that one and then we're going to pick that one. Uh, we're going to have a look down here. We had a nice little selection here. So what I can do again, just go into my library and just select all five of those and have a look at all five of those together. And I think, you know what? I think I'm gonna go for possibly this one here where she's just looking up. That's a real favorite of mine. This is where we chose to go from white to gray to black. Really simple use of the inverse square law to get, to get three completely different backgrounds in less than a minute. So check that one out there as well. And I think one more that we're going to try here is we're going to do this one here. Now, this one here was shot with the same light and the same lens and the same body as the first few before we changed halfway through. So we went back to our original setup with this one. So we can use the we can use the profile that we've set up already on this one to bring back some of the color. What I want you to really watch on this one is the color of Jasmine's top at the bottom, this sort of like corally style top. Just have a look at how much color we can bring back here. We're gonna switch from Adobe Color and we go straight into Jasmine R6 24105. Here we go. That's how much you're losing if you don't correctly manage your colors effectively in shoot and in, and in Lightroom afterwards. We'll just do that again. That was how it was seen in camera with the standard Adobe color profile. And this is it corrected. So yeah, we're gonna pick that one. <laughs> so we're gonna hit that. I'm just gonna get rid of my middle flag down here for my unflagged photos. And we're just gonna be able to see our flagged photos there only. So typically when I'm shooting, for anyone who shoots families and family sessions, I can shoot up to 250, 300 images in a family session. You've got a big generation, lots of different people there, lots of different groups. Um, typically, it'll be around about 200 family of four. You want to make sure you're getting good reactions. You want to make sure you're getting timings right. If you're dealing with kids running around, it can sometimes be a little bit hit, hit and miss. My first run through will always be in Lightroom. I'll never delete off the back of the camera because you can never be completely sure off the back of your camera exactly what's sharp, what isn't. So you need to see these images big. So if I get through 200, I will just go through them and get rid of three quarters. I'll get down to 50 straight away. Just X, 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 X on my Lightroom, getting them flagged with a cross flag. And I'll then go into that and I'll just get those deleted, get them off my hard drive. I'm now left with 50. In this studio here for family photography, we go from 50 down to 20 and we don't show any more. We, want, we don't want to give people options. We don't want to give people things to say similar shots. Which one do you like, this one or this one? We want to give them a completely different shot every single time. So it's harder to say no. So for that second run through, what I'll do is I'll go through my picks. So I'll go from 200 to 50 with my unpicks. 
and I'll go from 50 to 20 with my picks, and I should pick 20. Occasionally, I'll pick more. I'll get a second opinion in. If I'm, if I'm up to 30, my wife comes in, she'll get rid of 10 because she's looking at it with a much more, what's the word I'm looking for? Decisive eye from a sales point of view than I am. Sometimes it's difficult when you're attached to the pictures. You've got to speak to a salesperson to maximize those sales. So these are the five here. We're going to be looking at these. Uh, I think the three we're going to process, though, are going to be this one. So we'll give this one a five by pressing the number five on our keyboard. This one will press five, and this one will press five. So now I can come over here on my star. Where have I been? Good point. This I can come here on my star rating and hit the fives, and now it's showing me just flags and just my five star pictures. For this first picture here, we're just going to have a look at them now individually because I can afford to develop them individually. We're going to have a look at what we can change just a little bit. A tiny, 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 tiny bit of warming to those skin tones, just a little bit, just by moving that temperature gauge. I just nudged it up there to around about 4982. Um, we can round out the 5,000 just by clicking on it and typing in 5,000 and hitting enter. The exposure there, we're just starting to go on the skin tones into white just a little bit, but I do want a little bit more exposure there, just a little bit of a lift, always with a tiny bit of contrast. Now where those areas of white are going into high white, I'm going to try and bring them back in. I'm going to drag this highlights one down, and I'm going to drag this whites one down as well, just to retrieve some of that information. My shadows and my blacks are going the other way because I want to even out those tones from the highlights to the shadows. Texture and clarity. This really, oh, hello. My live feed's gone. Texture and clarity. Um, what I'm going to try and do on these, it depends on the type of shoot that you've got. Um, this is a soft feminine shoot. So what I want to do is I want to bring those down just a fraction, just to give us a nice soft feminine edge to some of the skin tones. We'll go into image number two now. This one here, I'm going to crop later on in, uh, in Photoshop. And we're going to have a look at the tones in here just by going over the top. We can see that it's pin sharp. Anywhere that we click on it, we can go in nice and close. So wherever you click, you go in nice and close. But I'm looking at that face first. That's pretty good. I'm just going to do, I'm going to keep it actually a little cooler on this one just to bring in some blue tones in and around that background, going for a slightly cooler image because she's sort of like looking a bit like an ice princess, bit like an ice queen there. And we're just gonna do the same with those sliders again and bring those textures down again there. And then this is the last one with mum. Again, we wanna be forgiving on this one. Little bit of exposure, but not too much. It's reasonably warm on that one already, which is quite nice. Going to bring in our contrast down with the highlights, up with the shadows, get a bit of detail back in that hair. And then again, your texture and your clarity. I'm just going to bring them down just a little bit just to be nice and forgiving. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to export, uh, sorry, edit in Photoshop. And that will open up my Photoshop folder. Back in. Any questions on the chat while those are opening up? One or two, but. Yeah, okay. Very technical questions. We will make sure there are people, there are technical people here who will make sure they get an answer to you. If I can't answer a question, there are better people than me to answer those questions for you. So don't worry. If you've put a, a question in the chat and we don't answer it tonight, we will get back to you and, uh, and someone, uh, someone will answer your technical questions. A couple of things while these are loading up. This BenQ monitor is really, really sturdy. We had to take it from downstairs to upstairs the other day. When we did the live shoot, we took it downstairs for a live tether, and now we've brought it upstairs. It's got this handle at the back that you can see here, which is really, really sturdy, and felt, it felt really, really safe when we were sort of bringing it upstairs. To move it up and down is actually really simple. It's got a really, really nice, light, smooth functionality to it. You can bring it round to the side, round to this side, and tilt forwards and tilt backwards. Tilting backwards is really good and really key because when you're using the calibration device, you want to get it nice and snug onto the screen. So having that tilt backwards means that you're getting a proper, good, simple calibration. And then your slot at the top there, the calibration unit goes straight through there and straight down, and then you just close that off for when you're editing. Really, really simple. 
The other thing that's really cool here is this hot puck, which I'm going to be showing you what all that's about in just a moment. Anyway, let's have a look at those images. Cool. So what I'm going to show you now is how I would edit an image for print uh, just using a few very simple Photoshop techniques. Now, there are a billion and one uh, Photoshop tutorials on, face, on, on, on YouTube and on Facebook and everywhere with lots of technical uh, details and technical things you can do. And there's loads of people out there. You can subscribe to their groups and they will show you how you can spend two, sometimes three weeks uh, uh, Photoshopping a single image. Uh, we're a working studio. We don't have that time. We don't have that luxury, uh, but we do like to make images look as good as possible for sale and for print. So I'm just going to show you the things that I'm looking out for in every image before it goes to print. It's that simple. So hopefully, hopefully we'll do something cool for you. The other thing to remember with Photoshop, there's going to be people in this chat who know how to do this better than me. There's going to be people in this chat who know how to do this differently from me. The thing about Photoshop is it's it's a hundred a thousand, a million different ways to skin a cat. There are loads of different ways to achieve a similar or the same result in Photoshop. I'm literally just showing you mine from 20 years of working with the tool. So here we go. We're gonna be looking at this image just to begin with. And the first thing I'm looking at, we've got a teenager, we've got skin. What we need to do is we just need to tidy up that skin. It's gonna be the first objection in the viewing room to not purchasing a picture. The simplest tool you can use to do this, to my mind, is the spot healing brush tool. Um, you can just make it bigger or smaller. I give it a reasonably um, a, a, a soft edge, bring the hardness down to somewhere around about 50%. And I control the side of it, the size of it, excuse me, with my bracket keys. So if I click my bracket key here, it goes bigger. And if I click my bracket key here, it goes smaller. And what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to find the biggest blemishes that I can to get rid of nice and simply the ones that are going to stand out on an eight by six print. So just here, 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 and here, just around here. And then the ones up in the skin tone up here. And we're just trying to just get rid of anything that's got a massive reflection and that is really likely to show up on print. But actually, we did a reasonable makeup job on this one. So we're pretty good, I reckon. We're just going around here. Lovely. Another way to do it is to right click, grab your patch tool, lasso round a section that you want to get rid of and take it to a section of clean that you'd like it to mimic. And you can do it that way as well. Slightly more scientific approach. And just start to tidy up bits of skin from around here. And that's going to mimic the texture of the area that you are taking it to. Two real simple ways of doing it there. I'm just going to grab hold of my, we just got some small blemishes here from where the makeup isn't quite perfect, just along, just along underneath the neck there. And I'm just going to grab my spot healing tool again and just go for these spots here and just grab those. And there we go. In under a minute, we're fairly spot free there, reasonably from a distance. And again, we can always bring up our history tool. There we go. We can go bigger and we can have a look at what it looked like to begin with and where we are now. So we've got rid of the big ones there. The next thing I'm gonna do on this one is I'm gonna go straight into my filter and straight into this new one that uh, Adobe released, uh, I think reasonably within the last year or so, neural filters. And it'll automatically select the face here, which it's done, it's automatically identified the face. There's loads of options down here. The one I'm gonna be using is skin smoothing. And what it'll do there is it just applies a skin smoothing filter across the whole face. You can affect the blur, the level of blur and the level of smoothness to your desired preference. You just need to wait for it to load. It'll, uh, it will do different things. And there you go, processing on device there at the bottom. It will show you how far it is along with that. But I'm reasonably happy from that. Down here is the output. I'm going to select new layer. I want a whole new layer for this. And the reason for that will be reasonably clear now. If I bring up my layers, it's on a whole different layer as a, as, as a whole different image. 
with neural filters, what I've found, I want you to focus on the nostrils down here. That's with the neural filter off. That's with the neural filter on. Can you see that lifting in tone? Neural filter on, off, sorry, neural filter on. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab my eraser tool and I'm just gonna erase around just inside those nostrils because I like a little bit of contrast in those nostrils. Just to give us a little bit of shape, a little bit of definition and a little bit of form. Control Shift E will flatten my image so that neural filter is now fully applied. Just up here, we've got a little line here just on the crest of the hair here where it's gone into white. So we've got a reasonably sort of tanned line here and then we've gone into white where the makeup hasn't hit here. So what we're gonna do with this is I'm gonna grab my clone tool. And instead of having the clone tool on normal, I'm gonna change my clone tool to color. And I'm gonna bring our opacity down here to a very low opacity of around about 15%. Nice soft edge to my brush. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take the color that I want this to be, I'm gonna hit Alt and I'm gonna select that area and then just really gently, I'm just gonna go over that slightly whiter bit with the color mode on. And what that's doing, just a little bit at a time, is it's just taking that area from previously what it was was white, as you can see there, to now a nice bit of color in there, a perfect blend into the top of the hairline. There it was before white, there it was before colored in. Now we're gonna have a look at the eyes. Really important eyes. Eyes are the focus of any portrait. They're the first thing that you go to. Um, I shoot a lot, of my port a lot of my creative portraits. I shoot with eyes closed. Um, and what that makes the viewer do is to make judgments and assertions on a portrait based on all of the other factors of the image, face shape, posing, composition, cropping within the cropping within and body language. Because we rely so much on the eyes to tell a story and tell us a little bit about a picture or a lot about a picture. So they're immediately the point that you go to. In any, I would think in any sort of full length or half length portrait, the brightest part of the portrait is where your eyes go to first. That should be the face. Typically it should be the eyes because the eyes have got white catch lights uh, and lovely white, white areas in it to drag your eyes straight into the eyes of the portrait. So let's just have a look at maximizing those potential there. Luckily, uh, I've done all right in camera here. That's another thing as well, so I forgot to mention that. Try and get everything right in camera as much as possible. You wanna limit the amount of time you wanna be using in Photoshop as much as possible. So many images as well, another point. I went Photoshop attacks, that's what I call it. It's like a Photoshop has just gone mad on an image. I always think, stand by this. Photoshop can make a good image great. It can't make a bad image good. You need that good image to begin with, so just try and get it right in camera first time. And we've got, we kind of got it here. The, uh, the, the, the eyes are really, really nice here. I'm just gonna drag my, grab my dodge tool here, make it a little smaller here. Loads of proper Photoshop photographers are gonna tell you to use masks so that you don't dis destroy the pixels in the image. I don't mind because this is an eight by six going up on a 10 by eight frame on a wall for a mum to buy. And I trust myself to do it properly. And I have the raw anyway there if I wanna go back and just start from scratch. Here we go. So we're gonna get a nice soft edge on this, an exposure of somewhere between five and 10%, okay? And I'm also gonna set my uh, dodge tool to just going after the highlights. So what that means is, is it's only gonna go from anything from high, uh, 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 lighter mid tones to through to the lighter, lightest, lightest highlights. And when you drag it across, it will just give a little bit of punch to those eyes. Just a tiny little bit there in the blue. And then I'm going to go over the catch light because I want that catch light to sing. Now, can you see that? That's the benefit of using just highlights. All it's doing here, I'm going to go super close so you can see. Just using highlights is just going to lighten up the square, not the black pupil. And really, really, really importantly, 
not the black eyelashes. So you still got that reflection in the eyelashes, so they still look real. And there we go from eyes that were like that to eyes that are like that. And on your full length portrait, you've gone from eyes that are like that to eyes that are like that. Just that little bit, just to drag you in. To my mind, my personal taste, I excessively did it there so we could see. But to my mind, I've overdone it a little bit there. So I'm gonna show you how we can bring it back in. We're gonna go back in here and we're gonna go down to our history panel down here. And we can see where I started dodging. I've made sort of six or seven dodge strokes there on the eyes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click the box to the left of the clone stamp here. And that's gonna be my source for my history brush, which is up here. I'm gonna grab my history brush. I'm gonna set it to an opacity of around about 30%. And what this will do, when I brush over it, is it will try and take it back to the state before we started using the dodge tool where we set it in that little black box on the left-hand side. So we'll get nice and close so you can see. And we're just there. And it's just brought it back in 30% from where it was. And now we have eyes that aren't too bright and are just right for what I want. Final thing to do is to bring up my crop tool. Like I say, I crop everything eight by six in studio just for the purposes of the way that we view. So I've got to choose a, a crop there that I'm, that I'm sort of comfortable with. I try not to crop through arms generally in portraits. So try and make sure an arm has an elbow, a, a shoulder has an elbow, an elbow has a wrist and a wrist has a hand. But just for this image, we want it to go nice and close. I don't, I, I wouldn't typically, I'm not particularly happy about the way that the arms are coming out, but it's what we've got and what we work with. And they are actually making quite a nice triangular shape up into the face in the picture. Once again, if you want to talk about hands and talk about the way that people pose hands, there's a million videos online about how you can look at Renaissance paintings and try and get hands posed absolutely perfectly. I, wrote, I, wrote, I shoot with a lot of ballroom dancers. We know all about middle fingers and threes and ones and all that kind of stuff. Search out other things. It's a minefield, but getting hands right is, is, is a key sometimes to getting absolutely perfect award-winning photography. I'm happy with this. I'm happy with the fact that it's just above the bun because we spent a lot of time on that bun. It's just in there. That for me is where I'm gonna put that crop. I did notice one thing earlier as well. There's a tiny little hair clip at the top here. So what we're gonna do, we do it one of three ways. Spot healing brush, boom, gone. Um, healing brush tool, we're gonna to take the area that we think it's gonna mimic, which is gonna be about up here. And then we're just gonna go over it there. Boom, gone. We're gonna do it with a clone stamp. We're gonna bring the clone stamp up here. We're gonna take it off color, put it back on normal, up the opacity so we're back up to 100%. We are gonna make that a little bit smaller and we're gonna choose the area that we wanna clone from, which will be around about there. And we're just gonna drag over, boom, way number three. And we're gonna get the patch tool here. We're gonna bring it back in and get the patch tool and then just drag it across to an area that looks roughly the same, boom, gone. Thousand ways to skin a cat. There's loads of different ways to do the same thing in Photoshop. Just choose the way that's best for you. That's my finished image there of her. I think that looks absolutely stunning and that'll be perfect for print. But I want you to focus as well with regards to the color checker, with regards to the color passport, look at the range of colors we've got in there from the background through to the foreground, the red lipstick, the blue eyes. All of that is only possible because we use the color calibration software, because we had the Adobe uh, camera raw correction, because we're using a screen uh, that shows off 99% of Adobe RGB. And I know that it's got a nice matte finish. So what I'm, what I'm seeing is absolutely perfect. I've got no distractions on that at all. Next one we're gonna look at is this one. Are we, are we all right? Is everyone, in, is everyone okay? Is everyone enjoying this? Are we, are we yeah, positive, positive? Is it useful? Is it good? We're gonna go do this one now. This is my favorite image from the whole shoot. Cool. So this one here, I'm not happy with where the catch lights are, but I can't do anything about it. If, if I was to reshoot this, I would bring that um, light up so that those, or bring her head down, do one of those two things, because I've got catch lights right in the middle of the pupils there. But I think just for the sake of the fact that those eyes are probably, I don't know what, 1% of the image and there's so much more to this image. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep it and I'm gonna work on this. The first thing, because of my OCD, uh, I'm not happy about 
is the fact that it's not straight. So none of these lines are straight. And I like working with straight lines. I like working with asymmetry or symmetry, but either way, I can't handle uh, a, a, an angle like that. If you're gonna do a Dutch angle, do a Dutch angle, 45 degrees, 45 degrees or nothing. That's what I say. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna do it the other way round as to what I did um, last time. I'm gonna do uh, my crop tool here and I'm gonna start off with the crop and then work backwards through the image. So I'm gonna get the crop right first. And I want to see a lot of that posing block. That'll do nicely, I think. In fact, I'm going to come just slightly out. So the important thing to bear in mind here is this grid that Photoshop has given me with these five and eighth points, the, the third points, I suppose, if you like, uh, within that, looking at the points of interest. And I want to try and get what I'm trying to work out here is trying to get her shoulders and her head in the top third, the converse in the bottom third, and everything else in the middle. And I'm looking at these arms and trying to get them evenly balanced within these lines here so that I know I've got roughly even balancing either side. That looks about right to me. If anything, we want a bit more space on the right hand side here because that's the space she's looking into. Let's just hit that, see how that looks. And um, we're gonna bring that, fill the frame with it. Nice. And we're gonna bring our line down here just to see how straight is that backdrop. It's not awful. It could just be a little bit better. But for the sake of this, I'm gonna keep it at that. Now, what we've got is a problem down the left hand side. Uh, we've got this area here. Uh, which is uh, obviously white where we didn't shoot. There's no information there, no data there at all. Now, for the sake of an eight uh, of a of a of a of a six by eight print, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to select everything to just outside the knee here with my marquee tool, which is located top right on my panel here. I'm then going to hit Control T, which is the free transform tool. I'm then going to hold down my Shift key. I want this to drag around here. If I do it without holding down my shift key and I start dragging that out, that box is going to go up and around there and I'm left with a problem that doesn't look good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to my free transform. I'm going to hold down my shift key so that just this area here is just going to drag out. I'm fully aware I'm destroying pixels whilst doing this, just so you know. But it's not too much of a problem because it's only the background. It's only getting printed eight by six. I think we're going to get away with it. We'll deselect that. Now we can get this big area here, but we only need to drag it a little bit and less than the bottom and destroy even less pixels here by just pulling this across just to there. Beautiful. Now, what we can do here is if I get my adjustments levels, my adjustment layers up, and if I get myself my levels, there we go. This is a levels adjustment layer. I should be able to see, and you'll forgive me if I can't. There we go. That will do nicely. I'm just going to pinch it in the middle there. Cool. Lovely. And I'm going to go into my layers now, which I've lost. They are there. Lovely. The bit where those two bits got stretched apart from each other is just there. So there's just a line on here that just needs looking at. By squeezing together those layers, I can see where those lines are and I can start to patch it and sort of smooth it out just a little bit there. I can even just get my um, mixer brush tool and just start mixing it together there and just getting all of these bits in so that there's no real marks along the backdrop. Get rid of our levels there. It's a really good way of searching for, uh, for dust on your sensor. If you take a mid-gray portrait of, 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 a, of a flat white wall and pinch those levels in together or drag, in fact, we can do it on this one. We'll do it on this one here. We'll get our adjustment layers here, get the levels up again. And if we drag, there we go. If we drag this end all the way across, we would eventually see where all of the where all of the dust in the sensor would be and as you can see that's on the background those ones down there these little these little marks down here they're on the background so we're gonna just spot heal those out excuse me 
Lovely. That's fine. You'll see I'm such I'm such a resourceful photographer that I clean my uh, I clean my uh, my screen on my on my R6 uh, twice a week. Uh, little swabs, get them online. Do keep your cameras clean. Every time you change a lens, you stand the risk of getting dust in there. The dust sen sensor cleaning technology is excellent. It's not foolproof. Keep your cameras clean. Anyway, get rid of the levels layer. Again, we've used a non-destructive layer there by using the levels in there. We go back into the face. Now I'm happy with the crop and I'm happy with the way that we've filled in that side of the frame there. Yeah, that's all good. Um, just, oh, the floor's annoying me now. So we're just going to go into the floor and get all the bits on the floor that aren't quite right just with our spot healing tool. Boom, 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 boom. Get that all nice and clean there. Lovely stuff. Bang, 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 bang. Cool. Now, going out to the, into the face, coming up soon, I'm going to show you what I use the puck for. I'm going to go into my spot healing brush tool again, and again, just very quickly, we'll do it in real time, how I would find and look for the spots on the face. We're just looking for those areas there, those areas there. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Perfect. Beautiful and simple. I'm going to go into our filter, go to neural filters. Again, go into our skin smoothing filter. It's found the face, it's smoothed the skin. Okay, it's saved as a new layer. I can go back into it. I can delete around about the nostrils, which is the area I don't like, and make those darker again. And then I can flatten that layer. Down here, we've got some hairs coming out of the bottom of the chin. So we're gonna bring that up here. We're just gonna get our healing brush tool and just get rid of those. Over here, we've got a little hair poking out here. We're just going to get rid of that with healing brush again. What we've got here as well is we've got like a bit of an L shape here where, where, the hair's, um, where the hair's sort of tied back. And I want that area there to be kind of smooth. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get my rectangular marquee, select that area. I'm going to go up to filter and liquefy. I'm going to use my push brush, which is there, the, the uh, forward warp tool. I'm gonna make my brush a lot smaller. It's way too big there. And all I'm gonna do is just with the edge of this brush, I'm just gonna knock it back in. Knock it back in like that. Knock the top out just a little bit and it will just smooth off exactly where I want it. There, so we've got a nice clean line now. There you go, look at that. Let's just have a look at that. Before, there and after. And it's just a really clean, for these, for these guys that do dance, I'm telling you, for these guys that do dance, particularly adult ballroom dancers, attention to detail. This is what we spoke about downstairs two days ago. We spoke about consistency and how all of this is working together. This, this color checker, the calibration software, uh, the passport, the monitor is giving me consistency so I can get to 90%. To get to 10%, that 100% extra attention to detail. And this is all attention to detail here. So now I'm reasonably happy with the way that is there. I'm just gonna knock off, yeah, some of the scuff marks on here can go, I like the dirty trainers, you know? Like if you weren't with us here the other day, that's why this, this shot was taken because of the dirty trainers, because it told a story, it went the extra mile, it wasn't cliche, it wasn't twee, it was something personal, it was something different. That's what you do with storytelling in portraiture. I'm just going to, uh, I need to paint this box, frankly. I don't know why I've drawn attention to it. I will repaint it for you guys. Uh, that is what I'm going to do. Uh, but it, it, I kind of like it a little bit scuffy, but not too scuffy there. We're going to keep the dirty trainers. Now, quick thing that I would do uh, with, this, with this hot putt key here. It's got um, a, a dial here in the middle to adjust your, to adjust your brightness, ju adjust a variety of other sessions, um, 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 a variety of other variables in there. It's also got numbers one, number two, number three. Number one is going to give me uh, my Adobe RGB um, calibrated monitor profile. Uh, number two is going to give me my sRGB. But most importantly, number three is going to give me my black and white. And I hope it works on this. If I suddenly change this to black and white, has it changed to black and white on the live feed? It has. Wonderful. Now, the brilliant thing about this is, is that it gives me a really, really, really good insight into how, as to how my image uh, looks. If I was looking to put something in, that changed. Oh, it didn't change. The black and white didn't change. 
Oh, black and white's only on my monitor. I'm so sorry. It did change it to black and white. I'm going to do it for black and white for you now. I'm just going to do it a quick way anyway. I'm going to show you. Hang on. Right. Now it's black and white. So, happy? <laughs> Good. The key thing about black and white is, is that it will show you where the, it's much easier in a black and white image to show where the lightest part of the picture is. And as I said about 15 minutes ago, the lightest part of the picture is where your eyes should go first. Okay. Ansel Adams, amazing landscape photographer, managed to tick off in every single one of his landscapes, managed to tick off every box on the grayscale. From, from really, really dark shadows to really, really bright highlights, but nothing was blown out. Everything was, was kept within range, but every box was ticked. What you want to do with these, with these portrait images here is you want to have a look at a black and white image and just see where the bright spots in the image are. See where your eye goes to first. In this instance, the arm actually there on the right-hand side is, is, is just as bright as the face. But also this knee down here is just as bright as the face. And what I want to do is I want to create a little bit of graduation in the contrast. And I want to try and bring those back in range. So I'm going to do that now. Let's go back to our color image. I'm going to create an adjustment layer uh, that is curves. There we go. There's my adjustment layer in curves. And I'm going to bring the curves down just from the middle down just to darken the whole image. I'm now going to go back into my layers. That's my adjustment curve layer there. I'm going to go a little bit large on the thumbnail so you can see. That's my adjustment curve layer there. If I take it off, we're back to original. We haven't affected. This is for all the people that like non-destructive techniques in Photoshop. Here we go. So it hasn't actually affected um, the original image. It's just an adjustment layer over the top. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my paint bucket tool. I'm going to switch it to black. Really good tip here. If you want to switch from black to white and white to black on your uh, on on your on your color swatch down at the bottom, just hit the X key. The X key. Watch it down here. You see it down here. Hit the X key. Go from white to black, white to black, white to black, white to black. Real simple way to do it. For this instance, I'm just going to go to black and I'm going to paint that whole layer in black. So what that means is that my layer's got nothing in it, so we're just showing through to the bottom. But we know where the areas are where I want to, uh, where I want to uh, paint over, where I want to lighten up slightly. They are this area, brilliant. They are this area here with the arm and this area here with the knee. Those are the areas that I really want to work in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back onto my layer and I'm going to switch this up to white and a white soft brush with a really low opacity, somewhere around about 15%. First thing I'm gonna work on is that knee. So I'm just gonna paint over that knee slightly, just gently, just to begin with. And you should see here, there, that's where the, that's where the impact is being made on the mask, which means the darker area that's being affected by that adjustment layer is now coming through, but it's coming through bit by bit and I'm in full control of it. It's a soft brush, it's not a hard edge brush. So it's just gonna bring it back in just slightly, but exactly where I want it. And you can start to paint up and start to affect the image. And this is the attention to detail. This is the extra 10%. If we take that layer mask on and off, we will see the very small changes that I've made there. That's it with it off. That's it with it on, off, on, off, on, off, on. But we're darker on those edges so that this face is more in balance so that our eyes are being drawn directly to the face. You can save that as a tip if you don't want to destroy it or you can just flatten the image there. Just as a final thing for this image, I want real impact and real power with this image. I'm just going to hit control M, bring up my curves, I'm just going to bring it up and I'm going to create a really gentle S curve here, but just a gentle S curve just to give me that little bit of punch on that picture, really make that red lipstick sing. So there we are. That's image number one processed, image number two processed. How are we in the room? Good. Okay. So five minutes, quick edit on this one. This one's gone, yeah? Yeah. Squid diddly. So this is the mum and daughter image, nice and big. And as we saw in Lightroom, how much more color we've got coming back 
off of uh, off of that top now. Okay. Mum and daughter image is really, really important. As we discussed, we, we discussed in the shoot here that we posed mum behind, daughter in front, gives mum a slight protection uh, away from the camera, but we managed to say a few things and get a nice natural smile. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so again, real simple here. We're just gonna go super close into the image in here and we're just gonna get a spot healing brush and just go over and just start spot healing again. Start bringing things in here. Now, the key thing to this one here is, which is quite interesting down here, is that we have a tiny little lipstick mark just down here, <laughs> just, underneath the, uh, just underneath the lipstick. So we're just going to go around here, just grab that and bring that to a similar area. There you go, completely gone. And while I'm on the patch tool here, I'll just go through patch tool, patch tool, patch tool. Mum's over here. Mum's got beautiful complexion. Not a lot needed to do there with mum. What we'll do is we'll bring, go again into neural filters. Skin smoothing, and because there's two in uh, two two image two faces in the image, the blue box is the one that you've selected. That's the one that we've done there. Skin smoothing for mum, and then we go over. We just adjust some of the settings, and we can do skin smoothing for daughter as well. And they will both be processed on the same on the same uh, layer there. We can go into it again, exactly the same as I've done before. I'm just gonna wipe out around about the nostrils, just get a little bit of tonality in there. That's lovely. Now for me, the coral and the lips and the reds are just a little bit too much there for me. So what I'm gonna do for this image here is I'm gonna to go to image, uh, adjustments and selective color. And that's gonna bring up here. Now I'm not just gonna take the blacks out of the reds, that would be ridiculous. But what I do know is that what's probably happening here is there's a lot of magenta pushing through. So I'm gonna select my magentas I'm just going to bring the blacks of the magentas down just a little, not much. And you can play around with these sliders actually by bringing the magentas of the magentas down that evens it out and makes it kind of nice. That's really nice in there. It's just a little bit less harsh now in terms of the reds. Just go back a step and we'll go forward a step there. Now we've got to decide on a crop. It's going to be a horizontal crop here, landscape crop. It's not so important that the bun's in shot here because it's not a ballerina picture. And this isn't normally how she'd wear her hair. We specifically did that hair for the photo shoot. So I'm going to go for a real close crop in here. In fact, I'm going to go even closer so you can't see any of that bun at all. But beautiful color there from the background. The lipstick now not completely overpowering. We could go into that. We could brighten up the eyes a little bit more. Uh, we could get rid of the reflection underneath the chin from the top where it's sort of gone a little bit red, uh, red under the top. But ultimately, for these family images, what mums are looking for are pictures of their children looking at the camera, pin sharp, smiling. And if you can do that, then you stand every chance of making money from family photography or at least creating some memories for people to cherish forever. That's all we really want to do with family photography. That's the whole thing about getting a print, get a print in hand. Is there any questions on the chat? Um, just one. Yeah. Which is, um, you can do similar editing techniques in both Lightroom and Photoshop. What thing do you, what thing do you prefer to do in both programs? Oh, right. I prefer to do my batch processing, my color correction, uh, my contrast and my adjustments to the tones and the colors in Lightroom. I prefer to do all of my cloning, uh, all of my, uh, uh, yeah, anything that requires making a thing that's not there, there, <laughs> I think is probably the best way to put it. That's what I prefer to do in Photoshop. I used to do all of my processing in Photoshop and I only actually came over to Lightroom about uh, 18 months ago. So ask me in 18 months time, I might be doing it all in Lightroom. I don't know. They're all interchangeable tools. I used to use Bridge. I still do use Bridge. I don't think anyone uses Bridge. I'm still using Bridge. Um, but yeah, so, and I'm always still learning as well, which is, which is like a really, really key thing, uh, I think, which is, which is, you know, really, really, really powerful. A couple of things. There's one other thing I forgot to mention about this monitor, which is the thing I really, really like about it. It's got US, USB-C connection, which you can use, uh, for, 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 for powering devices and, and, and for connecting to, but what I really like on it on this side here is an SD card slot. And that saves me going through all of the camera software 
and finding the right cable for the camera or finding where I've put my card reader. It just makes it so much simpler. It's got its own unique cable. And I genuinely, every shoot, I come up here and I stick the card in there and it just downloads straight from the monitor uh, into my hard drive, which is cool. So um, yeah, love it. It's really good. Anything else from anyone else? Nothing. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who's joined us from Muse by Lemesca and AQ Color by Ben Q Europe. And thank you to both of those for inviting me to give you uh, a tutorial today. I hope you found it useful. If you do have any questions, you can find me on the internet. I'm Whitey Jim Bob. Follow Muscle White Photo on Instagram because I promised my wife I'd get us up more followers on Muscle White Photograph on Instagram. So do follow us on there and she'll be pleased. Uh, that will give me, it's her birthday on Monday. Uh, so that will, yeah, that will give her a nice happy birthday if you give us a follow. Muscle White Photo on Instagram, give us a follow on there. And if you like portraits of half naked men, follow me, Y2 Jim Bob on the Instagram. Thank you to everyone who's invited me to do this. Thank you for being a part of it. It's been fun.